Welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. My name is Claire Shorenstein, and I'm a registered dietitian and running coach based in New York City. My goal for this podcast, aside from having fun, of course, is to demonstrate that there is no one-size-fits-all style of eating. Rather, there are many different pathways towards individualized health and sports performance. I explore this in my athlete nutrition profiles, as well as in interviews with fellow dietitians on their areas of expertise. I'm excited to bring you another wonderful sports dietitian guest today, Kelly Pritchett. And yes, in case you caught my last episode on supplements with Kelly Jones, this is my second dietitian guest named Kelly in a row, and both of them are awesome. Kelly Pritchett holds a PhD in exercise physiology in addition to an undergraduate degree in nutrition from the University of Alabama. She has been practicing dietitian since 2005 and currently is a professor of nutrition and exercise science at Central Washington University. She has a nutrition and coaching company with her husband called Tri-Dimensional Consulting that she runs on the side, and she's also a mom to three young boys, which, as a mom to two young girls, I can only imagine how fun and crazy that must be. Today's topic is a bit of a mixed bag. Kelly has multiple areas of research expertise, and we are going to touch on many of them. Our discussion very much centers on current research, and we do get a bit technical at times, but we always translate things into practical applications for athletes, so you'll be able to take away some interesting information and apply to your own training and daily life. Our topics today include hydration and cooling, electrolytes, recovery nutrition, and an extension of my supplement discussion to include some recent vitamin D research as well as some new research on iron, so definitely check that out. Just a heads up that my baby just learned to walk right before recording this and did not sleep. So you'll be hearing her at various levels throughout. So I'm not going to apologize for that, but that's just the way it goes. So enjoy her noises as well. But mostly, I hope you enjoy my chat with Kelly. Hey, Kelly, welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. How's everything going for you today? Going well. Thank you for having me, Claire. I'm excited. Yeah, totally. And uh, it's so funny. My, uh, I mean, this is just like 2020 working from home and all that good stuff, but my one-year-old literally just took her first steps 10 minutes ago. (laughs) And uh, so I'm actually really relieved that she's not screaming right now because we had to get her down for a nap. And as you can imagine, and you of course have three kids, um, you know, after a big milestone and taking some steps, usually they don't want to go to sleep. (laughs) But uh, (laughs) But yeah, so here I am, you know, she just took her steps and I'm sitting here in my bedroom and podcasting. It's, it's all good. It's good stuff. <laughs> Anywho. Um, but yeah, so before we dive into today's topics, can you share your background, including as an athlete and dietitian? Yeah, of course. So I was a division one swimmer at the University of Alabama. Um, I played a lot of sports growing up. I was fortunate that my mom, you know, kind of exposed us to everything and and fell in love with swimming at a young age. Um, So I swam at the University of Alabama for four years, and then um, I did my undergrad in dietetics. And then I guess like some students, I didn't want to go through the internship um, right away. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Because, you know, it's it's not paid and that sort of thing. And so I, I went on to do a master's in um, exercise physiology, um, and then quickly realized after that that while well, I didn't want to, you know, let my undergrad go to waste, so I applied for. We had a coordinated program at the University of Alabama, um, and then at the same time, I started my PhD, which I thought was kind of temporary. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I quickly realized that I love teaching, and so um, yeah, I guess the rest is is history. After that, I really really fell in love with the the teaching and the research part of it. Awesome. And and so you oversee the the sports nutrition program for our athletics at Central Washington University. So and that's a division two athletics program. So yeah, tell me a little bit about what your role is and, and what it's like being a dietitian in that kind of setting. Yeah, so um, we are probably one of the first, you know, division two programs to have a GA or a graduate assistant. So I've had a a GA position that I guess I've had for four years, but um, my role sort of started out as, you know, consulting with the teams on campus. And then over time, it's it's slowly um, evolved. There's not um, a lot of funding. So, you know, we don't have a training table or we don't have a budget that we oversee, but we Mm. do. (laughs) Yeah. So it's kind of tough. Um, in that regard, but 
Um, we do a lot of team education, individual consults, um, cooking demos. And then, you know, this year with COVID, that kind of threw a spanner in the works, but we've relied heavily on social media and um, Instagram seems to be a good platform to reach a lot of our athletes. Yeah, I saw that you have an Instagram. Are you running that directly? So I run that with my GA, with my grad. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah, no, I saw that and I'm following you now. So I was like, oh, that's cool. Um, yeah. But I know, I mean, and how many teams do you support? Gosh, so we ha- we see, we ever see men's and women's rugby, track and field, men's and women's basketball, softball, <laughs> football, uh, volleyball. I think that's it. Soccer. So we okay. see them all. Yeah. Wow. And, and is it like, like any student who needs um, help, nutritionally speaking, whether it's, you know, of their own belief or a coach recommends, they're able to just like work directly with you? Is that how that works? Yeah. Um, fortunately, my GA does most of the one-on-one consults because I wouldn't mm-hmm. have time um, yeah. in my schedule. But yeah, they schedule with her. Um, and actually, she's only contracted for 10 hours a week. And so far, it's been fine um, in terms of you know, the supply and demand. But yeah, hopefully it grows and we can turn it into a full-time position. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know that much about like nutrition programs in the collegiate setting, but what I do know is that it's lacking for the most part, (laughs) or at least that's my understanding. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, that most places do not have the nutrition support that they really could use. And I don't know if you have any thoughts or things to share on that. Yeah, totally. Uh, You know, there's a saying that we're kind of where strength and conditioning um, was 15 years ago currently. So, you know, most D1 programs are going to have, you know, maybe three to four full-time sports RDs, and those are your bigger programs. Um, Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely something that we need to improve on. And when I came out of my undergrad, that was what I wanted to do, but there were no, no positions at the time. Um, so it's, you know, we're fairly, fairly new in terms of the field. Yeah, no. And, and I mean, you mentioned lack of funding and that just seems to be kind of this theme in nutrition, you know, generally, like people are willing to invest in the coaching and the training, all that aspect, and often not in the nutrition, or it's just this like, oversight or afterthought, right? And they only come to you when it's like really bad. Um, So I do hope, I I mean, I'm really, you know, excited to see that, you know, things are improving, albeit slowly, but that there is a, you know, D2 program out there and and that you're, you know, kind of leading that. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, Yeah. So, and you also have a running and nutrition business on the side with your husband. You guys are like basically this like PhD superstar duo <laughs> with like training and nutrition. He's so he's the coaching aspect of things, right? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, we're yeah. fortunate yeah. that we we get to work together. We get to do research together. Oh, that's uh, so cool. <laughs> um, but but yeah, we sort of started this I guess a few years ago um, as a side gig. We're we're pretty mm-hmm. small, so we can only handle a few athletes at a time. But he was a runner at Western Kentucky, came over from South Africa on scholarship. And um, so he does the running and then, you know, sometimes triathlon coaching if we have some triathletes. And then I get to do the, the nutrition coaching. So it's kind of a fun gig. Yeah. And, and I saw on your site, like you guys do a lot of like testing and there's a lot of kind of data going on there. Um, do you do that? Like, where do you typically do, or, or I think I, you're, I saw you were doing testing type stuff. Are you typically doing that on campus is, or you guys have other facilities? Yeah, so that's on campus. Um, and that might have been for a lab that we teach, mm. or it could have been. So, so the way that works, we can contract through the university if we have someone that wants to do a VO2 max test. Um, and we're allowed to let them, they'll pay us for our time, but then they'll make a donation to the lab. Um, if that Got makes it. sense. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of cool. We can look at substrate utilization. We could do lactate threshold, um, VO2 max. We just got a portable metabolic part, which is kind of mm. cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. 
good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's only testing that I've done, you know, is, is the resting metabolic rate test, and, and that's about it for my testing with clients, but uh, that's not happening, nothing that's happening right now. You guys aren't doing that kind of stuff right now, are you? Are you all virtual? We're all virtual, but like we took the portable metabolic cart home, so we've mm-hmm. we've done some some of our lab demonstrations like outside with the kids. So <laughs> um, I think the nice. students probably enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wait. So are you teaching classes as well then? Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So what what exactly are you teaching? So I'm on a split appointment so I'm 50% nutrition and 50% exercise science so we're on quarters here at Central Washington University and I teach sports nutrition at the undergraduate level every quarter um some of the human physiology labs uh this quarter so we'll be going into winter quarter I'll teach an ergogenic aids seminar which is Mm. for our grad students it's super fun um, and then our basic nutrition or nutrition 101. And then we have a newly approved graduate sports nutrition course that I'll teach next year. Oh, that's awesome. That sounds so much fun. Oh, I love it. <laughs> what a nice lineup. And for my listeners, ergogenic aids, that's just anything that is uh, enhancing or affecting performance essentially. And that kind of, and of course I spoke with the other Kelly, Kelly Jones, um, recently on supplements, of course, we'll be kind of touching on that later. Um, but some of those, we, we mentioned some of those ergogenic aids. Um, all right. And, and lastly, we, you know, you mentioned your kiddos, um, or I'm assuming those were the kids, your kids, not the the student kids, but, uh, your mom to three boys. And so I imagine with everything going on, life must be quite, quite busy. Are you, I don't know how old they are, but are you like homeschooling and doing all that kind of stuff right now? Yeah, we went virtual when all of this happened in the spring. So we have been virtual. (laughs) Um, Oh man. And that is, that's been challenging for sure. I mean, I think the, the motivation varies daily. Um, but so I have a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a nine-year-old boy. Um, very active. I love the energy. But they um, are on the swim team, which is a good way to get out a lot of energy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they play soccer, and then you may have seen where they're picking up winter sports, so they're into the cross-country skiing, which is fantastic. Awesome. That's so great. Yeah, I saw you guys all out in the snow and. And uh, that looked pretty epic that you're all active together. That's that's so fun. I can't wait to just be active with my girls when they're old enough to like actually do things. <laughs> um, great. OK, so thanks for answering all those questions. And let's dive into today's topics, which are it's a bit of a mixed bag discussion on some areas that you specialize in and, and do research in. So this will be a little bit different than what I often do is like we pick a topic and like deep dive in it. So we're just going to pick a few things and talk about it, which is also really fun because I love variety. And uh, and then we get to kind of really see what you do, So uh, which is always great. So let's start with hydration and cooling. And we actually haven't covered this one in depth yet on um, the podcast. So I am excited to hear what you have to say on this today. So yeah, let's start by what the research says on this topic. Um, you mentioned a recent review paper on perceived sweat loss in athletes, for instance. Um, but but yeah, shoot away. Tell me what you have to say on this topic from the research. Yeah, great question. You know, I think hydration, you know, is so important because of its importance for regulating core temperature, playing a role in recovery, um, support immunity and and concentration when it comes to you know cognition or the brain so i think um super important when it comes to performance but we um, just recently published a review paper in sports medicine where we were looking at actual sweat loss versus estimated sweat loss Um, and we combined data from various papers looking at various activities ranging from rugby to hot yoga. Those were the, the papers from our lab, um, running team sports, fitness classes. Um, and so the, the methodology is pretty, um, applied where we will have athletes pour into a cup their estimated sweat loss. So we'll ask them, how much fluid do you think that you lost? And they would 
they'll pour it into a cup. So pretty simple um, in terms of the, the methodology. But basically what we found is the actual sweat loss exceeded the predicted sweat loss. So physically active individuals basically underestimated their sweat loss, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. There was no difference between males or females or, or exercise type. Um, and then another thing to note, you know, I mentioned like rugby and hot yoga. Um, some of these sports didn't exceed the 2% dehydration mark. So, you know, that's the case of where I would say they probably can get by um, without drinking anything during practice or something like that. Can you actually just briefly explain the 2%, just because we have a lot of non-dietitians listening to this, <laughs> um, just explain the 2 that like, what is the significance of 2%? Totally. So 2%, we're referring to fluid loss during during exercise. So if you lose 2% or more of your body weight, we consider that to be dehydrated. Um, and you know, it's fascinating because in the hydration world, this is kind of, this is really a controversial topic. Um, oh yeah. It is because a lot of um, the lab-based studies, the studies that were conducted in a lab where you could control the temperature and things like that, um, they kind of conclude that aerobic performance starts to decline after 2% dehydration. But more recently, there have been some studies that have been conducted in the field. So, you know, out in a normal playing or competition environment, and they're finding 3%. Um, might be the mark. So there's there's some some controversy, I guess. But me as a mm. dietitian, I would stick, you know, I'm going to be more conservative and I'm going to stick to what the NATA, National Athletic Training Association, the American College of Sports Medicine, those position papers um are still recommending that athletes stay below um that 2% dehydration or don't lose more than 2%. Yeah. Um, so one quick follow-up question on the study, and then we'll move on to practical applications. Um, so were you surprised by the results of that study, or was it kind of what you suspected would happen? No, I, I think that I think the athletes don't realize, you know, if we look at average sweat loss being around a liter per hour, I think a lot of athletes would be shocked. Um, and we did do a follow-up study. It's not um, mentioned in this review paper where we showed the rugby players their actual sweat loss. And then we came back the se second and third time and we asked them to predict how much they lost. And they were able to better predict their fluid loss, you know, after the education session, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. There needs to be more research, but I do think this might be an effective strategy is showing people how much they actually lose um, so that they have a better understanding. And how, how are you measuring the sweat loss? Um, so we're looking at pre-exercise body weight minus post-exercise yeah. okay. and any fluids consumed. And I think the main okay. thing there is to make sure that um, when you take that post-exercise weight that they are um you know in spandex they've taken their socks off clothes are going to hold sweat a lot of people don't think about that but but your clothes will hold that extra weight so yeah and and that kind of br brings me to that next section so kind of the next question is what are the practical applications from this research that athletes can take away and bring into their daily training and racing and and the first thing that comes to mind is that kind of sweat test that we mm -hmm. often, you know, do with clients or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's a really good point is that clothes can hold sweat. So, um, but yeah, why, why don't you kind of answer that question? And, and I'm glad you, you, you reminded uh, the listeners about that and me as well, because sometimes I even forget about that myself. Yeah, I think the best thing an active individual can do, especially a, an endurance athlete, if, if they're competing in an event that's over an hour, for example, is to go and, and see a registered dietitian and have them, you know, conduct a sweat test so um, that we can come up with an individualized hydration plan. Because, you know, the, the biggest thing I would say is it's 
there's a huge variation in sweat loss between um, individuals. So it's important that you you find a plan that, that's individualized. Um, and I can give you a good example of this. I can use my husband. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Definitely. You know, I think examples are good to kind of help people understand like what it looks like and how they can even do it themselves at home just to kind of, because obviously like from even activity to activity on the same person, we see differences, right? Depending on the environment and whatnot. Yeah, totally. So I can, you know, give an arbitrary, if you go out for say um, a two hour run um, and your pre-exercise weight let's say is is 160 and post exercise um it's 156 you've lost four pounds so um we would basically take that and divide it by your exercise time and then prescribe um a fluid plan based on that so we're not necessarily telling you to drink a hundred percent of what was lost um, so I'll typically, if I'm working with an athlete, I'll establish a minimum and a maximum amount and have them aim somewhere in the middle. Um, and obviously depending on what they've done in the past, but, um, mm-hmm. my husband going into, I think it was a half Ironman several years ago. He did not, he's, he's bad about <laughs> actually doing what I tell him to do. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But he asked me right Sounds before. familiar. Yeah, <laughs> you can relate. Um, mm-hmm. How much should I be drinking? Um, and I was like, I'm not going to tell you that. You need to practice this. It's individualized, blah, blah, blah. And so finally, he convinced me and I gave him, you know, the, the recommendations of around 20 ounces per hour. So, um, and that's coming from the position paper that that we would use but it's a again that's a a very general recommendation well he complained afterwards because he had to to pee on the bike and (laughs) Mm -hmm. and I think just stressing the importance of you know having that that individualized plan and that's a common complaint like when I you know when I've worked with people and I mean, granted, yes, you do need to obviously practice and let your body adjust, but that whole like, oh, but then I have to pee all the time. And that, that is such a common complaint. Any kind of tips there? Gosh, I think the biggest thing is, is practicing it. And then two, are you taking in something with sodium because sodium? Yes. Can, yes. Yeah. With the retention. Yeah, that is, yeah. I do think that's an inconvenient. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but at some point when you get these like long, so, I mean, especially with like the Ironman, I think I thought it was just like assumed you pee on the bike. I mean, again, I don't do triathlons, but from what I've heard, it's just kind of something that happens and oh, well, like at least you're performing well. Um, but Absolutely. yeah, no, I, I, I get it. Um, quick question about the kind of replacing, like how, what percentage you're place, replacing. I like, so what typically, like what percentage of your fluid losses per hour, are you typically trying to replenish during exercise? What would you say? Oh, so you want to, you know, you want to stay under the 2%. So um, if, you know, if I lose two pounds during exercise, I'm not replacing, are you asking after exercise? No, so what I'm asking is like, you said you're not replacing 100%. Of fluid losses, right? Gotcha. Yes. So, and I'm not sure if you were, maybe you were referring to after, not during, I'm not sure. So, but my question is specifically during exercise, how, like, what are we aiming for to, and I, again, I know it's highly individualized, but when you're working with people and doing a sweat test, like, how are you coming to say, like, how did you come to 20 ounces an hour for your husband? Um, or how, like, maybe you can just, just again, so my listeners can understand, again, with the caveat that it's highly, highly individualized and it's better to work with somebody. But if you're trying to just get like a general sense of how much to take in and say you you do a even like a naked pre and post weight on yourself to determine how much, you know, fluid or how many pounds you lose and how to translate that to fluid, like anything you can kind of uh, explain so that listeners might be able to kind of do something on them, themselves if they wanted to. Yeah, that makes 
that makes sense. And it's, it's a kind of a difficult calculation, I suppose. Um, the 20 ounces that I was talking about for my husband, that's just a general recommendation that, mm-hmm. that you would see like in a position paper. Um, but if we're talking about, um, you get a sweat calculator, you can find some of these online and yeah, you'll have to forgive me. I think it's St. Vincent's. They have an app that you could use on your phone. So that's something you could do. Um, mm-hmm. But generally, if I'm doing this with an athlete, I'll look at, say, pre-workout um, body weight and then post-workout. So somebody um, starts out at 159 pounds, let's say, after their 154 pounds. Well, how much did they lose? That's four and a half pounds. Um, and you tell me if I'm giving you too much here, but no, it's fine. <laughs> a pint equals a pound. Um, so that's about if we if we're looking at am I doing this right in my head? But um, basically, we want to keep them um, below that two percent body weight loss. So um, if they're losing, let's see, four and a half pounds, and they we take into account the fluids that they consume. So let's say they consume two and a half pints and their total sweat loss is seven pints. Um, so I would come up with a minimum and maximum fluid replacement rate. So the minimum fluid replacement rate allows for 2% of their body weight loss. Mm-hmm. Whereas the maximum would be replacing a hundred percent. So we want to aim somewhere in the middle. I know it's kind of complicated to. No, no, no. Yeah, no. I mean, I do these calculations too. I was just like, yeah. just like, I thought it would be interesting just to kind of talk through it so people can like understand, or maybe even a, like a, a way of thinking about it for people is, you know, when we see one pound of body weight lost, what does that equate to in terms of fluid? Yeah. So a pound is is 16 ounces or a pint. That's a, that's a good visual maybe that's a maybe that's an easier way for people to kind of grasp it um Mm -hmm. uh yeah okay awesome yeah and and obviously again you know and and when I've done kind of sweat test type stuff with people like that whether they're doing like an indoor cycling class or an outdoor run and it's different times of the year and and we see different things going on so it's 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 a good idea to kind of test in different situations, different sports and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, any other practical applications you can kind of think of from, um, from the research that you've done that you haven't mentioned already? Gosh, I just, yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, a practical measure that athletes could use if you want to, when I think of hydration, I think of, um, chronic. So are you chronically hydrated? Um, as well as we could talk about acute during the exercise session, Mm -hmm. but, um, so some, some practical measures they could use first thing in the morning, they could assess their thirst. So how thirsty am I? Um, they could look at, you know, daily changes in weight. So taking your weight first thing in the morning, and if you notice any huge fluctuations, um, that could be an indicator that you're not um, well hydrated and then urine color. So, um, using all three of these together can be a, you know, a practical way to assess on a daily basis. What are you typically recommending to clients in terms of like their overall fluid intake to maintain a good hydration status? Are you um, I mean, I know there are like generalizations out there from different papers, like, I think it's like, what is it? 16 cups for men and 11 for women or something like that. But um, uh-huh. are you doing like pounds divided by two to get ounces or like, what are you typically doing to kind of advise um, athletes? With that? I mean, the pounds divided by two um, tends mm-hmm. to be an easier one for a lot of people yeah. to remember. So I'll use that. And then the other thing is, that I'll tell athletes too, during exercise, a sip of fluid equals about an ounce. So if I tell you, you need to have four ounces every 15 minutes, that's four sips. I think a lot of athletes can wrap their head around that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that can be certainly like a tricky thing to figure out when you're 
you know, like, let's say you're racing for like, you're doing a half marathon or marathon, and you're taking water from the cups, and you're trying to assess like how much you're drinking and all of that. So that's definitely a handy, a handy tip there for whenever we get back to racing. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, do you think it's interesting, you were talking about the controversy of two versus 3%. And I think about, you know, I would just, just what was it a day or two ago, I, 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 cause I actually work with, um, you know, quite a few high school and collegiate, um, collegiate runners and other athletes. And, uh, but so many coaches, like someone told me that her coach actually wouldn't let them carry water or something. And, and I mean, of course this has to do with like, and I'm sure you have plenty of experience with just like educating coaches on nutrition and hydration. Cause I feel like so often we run into coaches that are not very encouraging with their athletes, like even letting them take food and nutrition, like in hydration on, um, but yeah, maybe you can speak to that a little bit, but it, it kind of shocked me that there would be a whole practice, um, you know, grant, but even in winter, like we still have hydration needs. Um, and, you know, but there'd be a whole practice where like water was basically not allowed. <laughs> I'm like, uh, that's a little shocking. I don't know. What is your experience with kind of that kind of stuff with, with coaches and, um, and especially with like hydration or just like the culture of having, you know, nutrition, hydration, um, available. Yeah, I think that I think that is an issue and I think it comes comes down to you know maybe the coach's background nothing against against them but you know where what's their education or their nutrition education experience and I think that's really where uh we as practitioners you know still have a lot of work to do in the field so it you know it could be just getting them to buy in um, to nutrition and the fact that it can can make a difference in your performance. And usually when they hear that, I feel like there's a light bulb that goes off. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's hard. <laughs> well, it's hard. It's hard definitely when, I mean, you have the benefit of being in, in the, you know, on campus, like you are able to, I'm assuming, connect with coaches and work with them. And, and of course, like, you know, on my end, you know, there have been times where um or like I would be able to in theory you know speak to a coach and talk to them about things but I think it's harder now especially like if you're working virtually with clients across the country and you don't have any relationship with the coach whatsoever and you're like like what you're suddenly going to like call them up and be like hey you need to let my client have water and it's like embarrassing for the client and like you know it's just like oh like how I don't know it's just it's a little bit frustrating and um I was just yeah, I, I mean, I, I imagine it's it's something that I've certainly encountered multiple times. Um, but I, I, again, it's one of those things I think is getting better. But um, but yeah, but it kind of brings me to my next question. I mentioned colder environments, and we still have you know hydration needs, obviously. But given that many of us are experiencing colder temps right now, um, yeah, I'd love to for you to share with us how we can adjust our hydration um, or, you know, what our, you know, how our hydration needs change uh, when the temperature is colder outside. Yeah. So, so a few things happen um, physiologically and that your thirst tends to decrease. So there's a tendency to drink less and that, you know, not just during exercise, but also chronically, like throughout the day, um, people tend to drink less. I mean, I even notice it myself. I don't know about you, but, mm. uh, and then there's something called cold induced diuresis. So if you've ever noticed, as soon as you get outside, you might have, um, the urge to pee. Um, but that's, <laughs> that's, yeah, it happens. <laughs> um, but that is, you know, one of the mechanisms the body uses to keep warm. And so um, you know, I think the main thing during the winter is to look at your sweat rate again, because that's going to change um, in a cooler environment. Um, and then, oh, two, I would also say be careful with your clothing because we do tend to overdress. And so if you're creating a sauna in your clothes, <laughs> you're yeah. going to be able to dissipate the heat um, effectively and, you know, your sweat loss um could go up and you know it's basically inefficient at that point you're not cooling the body as well um so in that case i would say you know dress in layers dress in things that you can kind of throw off along the way um on your run i'm notorious for leaving jackets and things <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um 
you know, some other things you can do. You can uh, consume sodium containing beverages that'll help you retain fluid. Um, warm beverages before and after could help you warm up if you're going outside um, and it's super cold. But one, I guess, caveat there with the, the pre-exercise, I wouldn't necessarily do that before a race per se, because you, you know, you might increase your core temperature slightly. That might not be what you want to do. Um, yeah. Well, that's interesting. Maybe you don't want to, I'm, I'm thinking back like specifically to like running the New York City Marathon and you're like out in the cold for like hours and hours and people are like drinking the Dunkin' Donuts coffee and just like huddling <laughs> together. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's so long before the start. It doesn't matter if you're drinking a hot beverage and you're just like frozen to death. Uh, but, right. um, but I guess like if you're like heading out the door and, and, and uh, you're about to race and you want to be careful about that, but um, okay. Awesome. But yeah, I think, I think some, we, we often just forget or, or don't prioritize hydration enough, especially during exercise thinking, oh, well, it's cold. It doesn't matter as much, but I mean, but it does, and we still are sweating. Um, and I know at least here, you know, the heat's blasting, the air is very dry. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, definitely still getting thirsty, but, um, but yeah, it's easy to kind of, you know, especially if you're busy with work or anything else, just like with food, it's easy to just disconnect and forget about drinking things. So, you know, it still is important to kind of keep a bottle around and do all that. Um, do you emphasize like when you're doing the, uh, weight divided by two to get in out, you know, get fluid ounce needs per day, do you include, is that plain water or do you include other like beverages? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the person and, and what they like to drink. Let's say they drink milk, um, because actually uh, milk, if you look at the, there was a study done by Ron Mon, um several years ago where they looked at, you know, the hydration quality of, of different beverages. And they actually found milk and Pedialyte or an oral hydration solution to be the best in terms of, of rehydrating people. So yeah, I would take into account milk or juice or um, coffee counts as well. <laughs> what about seltzer? A lot of people are drinking seltzer these days. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. And I think it's important to keep in mind as well that many foods are hydrating. And if you're having soups, especially in winter, like brothy soups or or in the summer, if you're having like watermelon or other fruits and vegetables, like that is contributing to, to water as well. Yeah. Um, awesome. Let's briefly mention cooling in terms of, I mean, I know at least out here, it is like summer just seems like eons away. <laughs> but, uh, well, cause wait, was it yesterday? Winter started? Yeah, so we have a while. But um, but why don't we just touch base on warm weather in case any listeners are somewhere warm and lovely or someone's, I don't know, like not many people are going on vacation these days, but, but let's just touch quickly on cooling uh, mechanisms and any kind of tips you have or any research you'd like to share on hydration and cooling in, in warmer weather, hot, humid, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I think one thing to, to remember there, we really emphasize hydration in, in a hot environment, but um it's really the environment that that poses a a bigger challenge to the body um, than say your hydration status, if that makes sense. So I'm not saying we need to (laughs) um, overlook hydration, but if you're going into a hot environment for competition or for a race that you're not used to, um, that can sometimes, you know, be the biggest factor when it comes to um, performance. But being hydrated (laughs) can be Mm -hmm. um, helpful. That can be one thing, you know, that you can do to to counteract that environment. But um, ice slurries. Now, this is some of my um, hydration and cooling work has been done in athletes with spinal cord injuries. And so they kind of jumping to a different topic, but they don't sweat below their level of lesion. And so we've looked at things like a spray fan, mister. ice slurry ingestion. So that's just like um, a sports drink that's been gone through a slurry machine. Um, And we found, you know, both of those methods to be effective and and keeping them cool perceptually. So, you know, I would, there's research as well in an able-bodied population. Um, Mm -hmm. 
that has shown the ice slurry to be effective. So it could be, you know, drinking cooler temperature beverages is a way to, to stay cooler. Um, not wearing dark clothing. <laughs> so yeah. Just, yeah. Common like, sense stuff. <laughs> um, awesome. Having more air okay. exposed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All too often. Like, I, I mean, I remember this is back like ages ago, back when I did my like run coaching certification. I just remember one of our like coach teacher people where they were just like, oh, it drives me nuts when people wear capris because <laughs> like, you're blocking like behind the knees. And then you see people like, you know, like, like wear a visor instead of a hat and like, you know, wear a tank top instead of, you know, so it's like just leaving yep. open all those cooling centers. Um, you know, so I don't know, they always stuck with me, like the capris and I'm like, oh man, definitely oh. guilty. I mean, I love my capris, but, but definitely when it's hot, I am not wearing capris. Um, yeah, cool. Um, awesome. Anything else to share in hydration cooling before we move on? No, I mean, we could, we could touch on electrolytes or we could, oh, we yeah. could but yeah, let's talk, let's talk electrolytes, um, briefly before, um, <laughs> I mean, that's a big one, obviously. Uh, yeah. So let's, let's talk about, um, any kind of, what would you like to share on electrolytes in terms of, yeah, actually, cause sodium amount, I mean, obviously sweat, uh, the amount of salts that we lose in sweat is very individualized, just like with the amount of fluid we lose. So how are we determining um, how to replenish that? Yeah, and that's a that's a good one because, um, you know, you'd have to have access to sweat sodium patches to actually get a valid estimate. But um, to me, it, it's kind of been trial and error with a lot of athletes that I work with. Um, obviously, you want to look at, at duration as well. So um, there's a wide range in, in sodium needs. I'll have, um, you know, I have one Ironman triathlete that I work with, and she takes in a gram of sodium um, per hour. And so wow. You know, visually, you can see it on the athlete's skin if they're a salty sweater. I don't know if you've, you've probably mentioned yeah, this yeah. before but um I think it's just kind of assessing um the athlete and and what's what's going on you know a marathon um electrolytes are are important but you know we're not gonna see that high high um sodium intake that we might see for an Ironman um triathlete yeah and it's funny too because you know, you look at sodium content, I mean, it's changing a little bit and I've seen some products come out with higher sodium content, but often you look at like gels or just typical things that people are taking in marathons or half marathons, whatever it is. Um, and the sodium content isn't that high. Like it'll be like 40 milligrams or 30 milligrams or 60 milligrams or whatever it is. It's pretty low, you know, mm -hmm. when, um, like what, what the average, like maybe you can share some average, sweat. uh, uh, sorry, average salt losses with, with my listeners. Cause sodium, what is it? It's, it's, uh, 500 milligrams to yeah. 15 or 1500. Is that it? It's about, uh, you know, I would say a good average is probably around 500 milligrams. 500. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, um, but the nice thing, you know, you mentioned gels, there are some products out there that, um, you know, for those athletes where their sports drinks just maybe don't do it. Um, or, or don't work with their stomach, but um, e gel and what's the other one? Unived. Those two products they offer some gels that have about 200 milligrams of sodium. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I, I think uh, Huma um, has an electrolyte plus version and SIS. I love uh, science and sport gels. They have one that has more electrolytes. It's not, I think it's more like 160 though, it's not 200, but it is higher. Those are the ones I've seen. And of course there are like sports drinks out there that offer a lot more. Um, but I find that for like, mar especially for road marathons and, and halves and stuff, like but most people aren't wanting to carry a sports drink, you know, they're wanting just to stash something in their pocket or whatever. But I always think it's curious though, given that most people do need more than what's found in sports mm -hmm. products that that mo like the the average like you know goo and you know shot uh, cliff shots all those things don't have more electrolytes I don't know what are your thoughts on that yeah um I, and I do think that a lot of athletes just rely on the goos and water and, and they don't they don't realize that they need the sodium too and 
um, you know, maybe they have issues with cramping or, or and again, with cramping, that's a whole nother topic. Yeah, um, it's not just the salts, right? <laughs> really know what causes cramping there's so many different culprits but um but yeah it's just being mindful of that and I would say you know at least 200 200 milligrams at at minimum um per hour if we're talking about a marathon that's really the lower end um so if somebody was to use one of the the gels that have the higher um sodium concentration they may be able to get by with that and water yeah. Yeah. Especially if they're doing like one to, you know, if they're doing like one every 30, 45 minutes or something. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Awesome. And any, what about for, so what about for longer distances then? Um, I mean, obviously you can get salts, not just from sports products you're getting in food, you're getting, um, or you're doing like, if you are doing sports drinks and, and that kind of thing. Um, but where, like, what's a good starting point? Like, let's say you don't have access to some special test you know what's kind of a good starting point for sodium intake because I mean I guess you can like I when I'm working with people like taste is a factor like 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 like, I know the salt stick there are the salt pills and all that but the problem with that is you can't taste it and as you know like if you're in need of salt and you have something that's like salty and you're just like oh my god this is the best thing in the world then that's a sign that you probably need some salt uh versus just popping pills which is easy but you know uh, you can't taste it necessarily, but yeah. What are your, some kind of thoughts or practical kind of tips on, um, training and that trial and error with, when it comes to electrolytes and obviously it's not just sodium, it's the other ones as well. Yeah. So I think, you know, before the event or before exercise, you might want to consume a, a sodium containing beverage. It could be a sports drink or it could be a noon tablet um, or salty foods like pretzels, um, tomato juice, broth, you mentioned, um, and that's going to help stimulate thirst and, and fluid retention. And then during exercise, gosh, it, it really, really depends because like you said before, um, the sodium loss ranges anywhere from, I think the average is like 220 to 1100 milligrams per pound of sweat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's crazy. So I would, I would look at your, you know, how much, how much you're losing, how many pounds you're losing in sweat per hour. Um, And then based off that number, I would, you know, do at minimum um, 200 milligrams per pound um, of sweat loss. And that's minimum. So, um, Mm. yeah, so it's just, it's really looking at the products the athlete's taking in. Um, how much is in their gels, their bars, if they're doing blocks, things like that. Um, Are you recommending salt pills or do you like discourage those? Um, you know, if I have an athlete with like the, the Ironman triathletes that I work with, um, mm-hmm. he uses the salt sticks. And so um, it, you know, I don't necessarily think it's necessary for, for everyone, but for someone with a high um, sodium need that can help. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, any other thoughts on, on, uh, electrolyte? I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would say is just remembering that we get electrolytes in real food. <laughs> so people are so focused on like you know noon and drinks and all these different products but you also can eat real food and drink water like that is also an option and obviously salt is in your food and whatever but um when it comes to kind of recovery and all that which is a really good segue into our next topic recovery nutrition um that's another area of um research and expertise for you so if um as before if you can share some research on the topic and then some practical applications that would be awesome yeah so uh, my dissertation topic was actually looking at chocolate milk (laughs) and recovery um, nice which is kind of funny i guess thinking about it now i remember i had a a um another um a colleague at the time was like you're doing what (laughs) 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 um but but we looked at chocolate milk 
um, on markers of, of muscle damage and subsequent exercise performance. And we compared it to an over-the-counter recovery beverage. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Endurox, the powder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and we found that chocolate milk was just as effective as um, Endurox from a recovery standpoint. And one thing to note is a lot of research doesn't look at you know subsequent exercise performance. And that's something that with, with the recovery research. So having them come back into the lab and do some type of time trial. Um, and we found that the, you know, the chocolate milk was just as effective as the, the over the counter recovery beverage. So, you know, I guess the practical application there is you don't have to spend lots of money on these fancy beverages. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, and that, uh, you know, something like chocolate milk can, can get the job done. And the, the nice thing about chocolate milk is it takes a lot of the guesswork out um, for athletes. And so, you know, with our collegiate athletes, for example, who, who don't want to have to think about um, the math or how many grams, et cetera, chocolate milk is a, you know, a nice portable option um, that athletes can use. And we actually use it with our athletes on campus. Um, Mm -hmm. but you know, I guess the, if we talk about the properties of chocolate milk, you're getting carbohydrates, um, in the form of simple carbohydrates, which, um, within that post-exercise period convert a little bit more easily to muscle glycogen. Um, and then you're getting protein, you're getting fluids, you're getting sodium, potassium, and calcium. So you're getting those electrolytes as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And, and why don't like, let's back up for a second and just maybe you can briefly discuss for any listeners who are, who don't really know much about what we're looking for in recovery nutrition. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. What, what are we typically going for the timing, all of that, if you can just kind of give a basic overview. Yeah. So one thing to, to mention first is, you know, we, we really, I think as dietitians, we, we harp on recovery nutrition, but it's, it's not necessary that we, you know, emphasize it for something like a yoga class or, you know, like a 45 minute spin class. It's really those individuals who are, who are working out, you know, two times a day, or they're doing their long, a long workout that's, you know, longer than 90 minutes, um, who need to really, um, hit the, the higher numbers when it comes to the recommendations. Um, But I like to talk about the four R's of recovery. And so you're going to refuel with carbohydrates, repair with protein, rehydrate with fluids. And then the fourth R is you're, you're reinforcing with, with antioxidants. So that would be your fruits and vegetables, for example. Mm. Mm -hmm. I like that. (laughs) <laughs> numbers or <laughs> um yeah yeah and and I mean all I would say for that is I mean obviously if someone's like a 45 minute spin class like you can destroy yourself <laughs> so I mean it does I think it does depend on like the type of workout you're doing or you know if you're doing strength work along with it or what's going on there um and it also depends like some people like I know some like I work with a lot of recreational you know athletes and and so maybe someone does a whole workout and then has breakfast afterwards. Like, like, Uh obviously we don't want to skip that kind of, like that is still recovery nutrition. We don't want to skip that. Right. So, you know, like when you were talking about enforcing recovery nutrition for yoga, like, are you, are you thinking more like, like if you did a yoga class at some point in the day and you don't need like a special, like you don't need to take chocolate milk after that, that that's kind of what you meant. Just clarify. Okay. That's what I'm getting at, not to to de-emphasize it, but you know, I think when when I give like specific recommendations, if I say you know in terms of carbs, you need um, half a gram of, of carbohydrates per pound of body weight per hour post exercise, you know, for the first two hours up to six hours, and then you need to have about 20 grams of protein every hour. You know, that's I think that really needs to be stressed. Um, more, as I said before, for those who are doing heavy training, but yeah, you know, like you said, I always eat something after I exercise. So <laughs> why not? I'm take, hungry. I don't know about you. <laughs> why not take advantage of it? And, um, I think it's a good time to fuel 
um, you know, because we do have increased blood flow to the muscles, then we have some other favorable factors that are going to convert that food into muscle glycogen. So why not? Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, all too often, you know, we're all emphasizing, oh, you know, eat within, you know, 30 to 60 minutes or within two hours or whatever, you know, people are saying, I feel like I hear both. Um, but, uh, you know, eat within this window of time and it's this like magical time and and then that's it. Like, it's not like the door shuts and that's it. You can't recover anymore. It's, this is an ongoing thing. Like your body's still, re- it's just more receptive. As you said, you got some good blood flow going on. And um, mm-hmm. so, you know, I always, I always emphasize that as well, that it's also more about how is it fitting into the rest of your day? Because if you just did like an hour, hour and a half workout, even if you are a recreational athlete and you're not doing another training session and there's not some huge event you're training for, but if you're doing that and then you're not really eating for, you know, hours and you just, and then, and then like later on you get hungry and your eating patterns all messed up. Like, you know, like you still want to feel good and have energy for, you know, not get recovered or not get injured and all that kind of stuff. So I think that, you know, we have obviously different goals and needs when it comes to working with, athletes who are training heavily or in the collegiate setting or her professionals versus like the everyday exerciser who still wants to feel good and still needs to focus on aspects of recovery. Right. Definitely. I, I definitely agree. And the one other thing that I see a lot with like with college athletes in particular is they tend to emphasize protein and it's I'm going to have a protein shake right after and there's no carbs. So yes. <laughs> oh, God drives me nuts. <laughs> so that's another thing, you know, uh, if I had to like emphasize one over the other, it's, it's really the carbs that, that are going to be most important. Yeah. And when you're working with different, like, well, I guess you're not doing that one-to-one work so much anymore, but, um, or right now, but when you're working with different sports, Mm -hmm. You know, can you speak to that a little bit about, you know, what are some major differences that you see in terms of maybe some recovery nutrition recommendations you're making? Like if you're working with a, um, I forget all the sports you listen, I remember rugby or something else, but, but yeah, any, do you see any differences that you, you want to kind of point out or that that might kind of speak to or translate into some differences in sports listeners are doing or anything you, that you think is interesting to share there? Yeah, I mean, I think that really goes back to um, the nature of the sport. Is it more anaerobic? Is it more aerobic? What phase of of training are they in? Are they, which I forgot to mention, but (laughs) um, Mm -hmm. are they they in competition phase of training? And, um, you know, we've done a lot of work with with rugby and actually um, we we did do a study with, um, what did we looked at Coco? Um, in addition to chocolate milk with the rugby players, but, you know, for an example, they might have back-to-back games in a day, um, mm-hmm. where I think that is really where you got to stress the, the recovery nutrition is when those athletes are, are playing multiple tournaments or, or multiple games. So, you know, sports like soccer, where their, um, you know, average game length is, around 90 minutes. So again, that's another sport that, um, the recovery becomes, you know, more important, um, football players doing two a day. So it it just depends on where the athlete is in their. Yeah, absolutely. And then of course, I mean, this is where like, yeah, every sport just has its unique, you know, Mm -hmm. challenges and, and needs and, um, you know, or even some, some events or training circumstances where you don't necessarily know the timing of what you're doing, you know, yeah. like you don't know exactly what time you're going to do something. And maybe your event is very short and you're trying, and it's at an odd time of the day, you know, like I've worked with high school swimmers and they're doing these meets and it's like in a different mm-hmm. town and it's like random times and they're going on several times. So, it's, so, you know, we're all dealing with all these different challenges and that, and I think that's what makes sports nutrition so interesting. You know, it's, it's, you're dealing with the individual, you're dealing with all these different sports, all these different logistical challenges. And, um, yeah. it's, it's hard, but it's interesting and fun. So, uh, it's like a big puzzle, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Awesome. So thanks for sharing all of that on recovery nutrition. 
And um, yeah, so the last thing I want to briefly mention, um, you, you know, when we were kind of connecting to plan this podcast, you were mentioning that you listened to uh, my recent supplements episode with uh, Kelly Jones, another dietitian. And yeah, I'd, I'd kind of love to continue that discussion just a little bit um, to see if you'd like to add anything. And, and also because I know you've done some research on vitamin D, which is definitely a hot topic, especially with COVID right now. So maybe that's a good place to start. Um, is there anything you'd like to share on vitamin D that you don't think we covered? Yeah, and you or maybe know, we did cover it. Well, <laughs> it's okay. Um, Kelly did a, a fantastic job. I, I enjoyed listening to that um, episode. but. I can speak a little bit to our last study that we conducted with a vitamin D supplementation protocol um, in athletes with, with spinal cord injury. So I don't know if you've caught that, but I, I do really have a passion for, for working um, with that population of athletes. And, yeah. um, but is, is there a reason, is there a personal reason why or any reason why, or it, I don't know. You know, it kind of morphed my husband's dissertation. Um, Topic. So he he also he teaches in exercise science, but he looked at um, cooling um, with the University of Alabama wheelchair basketball team. Um, ah. And so yeah, since then we've we've both really had an interest in it. And um, I've connected with um, Liz Broad, who was at with the USOC Paralympic, um, mm -hmm. and she's their dietitian. She's no longer there anymore, but. A lot of these um, research studies kind of um, evolve through that collaboration, long story short. But, but no, I just, you know, I cool. feel like population that really we need more research on. And so um, I'm excited to kind of fill that, that gap. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so back to the vitamin D. Um, one thing I guess I wanted to mention is we used a sliding scale supplementation protocol. So a lot of the research that's been done will just give a dosage like 4,000 IUs of vitamin D3. Um, but in this particular study, we prescribed supplements based on um, the initial vitamin D status. So if they were deficient, that group got um, a different dosage than say the insufficient and sufficient group. Um, and so we followed them for typically takes about three months to see a change in vitamin D status. Mm -hmm. But this sliding um, vitamin D supplementation protocol was, it was effective at, um, we brought all of our athletes or 96% of, of the population to um, a sufficient vitamin D status. And you can, that's find, awesome. Yeah. And I could go into the protocol, but I don't know that you could find that in our paper. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See the oh, it sounds like my baby has been screaming for a little while. <laughs> well, and apologize for that. That's just podcasting, I guess, from home. That's but that, need actually, to... I don't know if she ever fell asleep. No, no, it's all good. My, my husband's on top of it. We, we've got okay. this whole taking turns working thing going, right? <laughs> I understand. But, Oh my god. Yeah, we have a small, we have a little two bedroom apartment here in Manhattan. So uh, you know, you can pretty much hear everything. So, anyways, at least at least she waited to start wailing until we're kind of approaching the end. <laughs> anyways. Um but yeah, so I mean, one thing that um continuing on vitamin D, uh one thing that because Kelly uh, Kelly Jones did this whole thing on Instagram on vitamin D that I mean I'm sure you you saw that she was you know kind of just going over all kinds of topics on it which was awesome um, because vitamin D plays a role in so many different things in the body of course mm -hmm. and um, one of the things that I was um, asking her and and she kind of pointed out to me which I was like oh yeah duh <laughs> but I was working with a client who uh, is recovering from a stress fracture and. Um, was to, I think she's taking like 5,000 IUs or something. And, and I, and, and I remember the client asked me, is that too high? And that's just like what she had been taking. And I was just like thinking to myself, I'm like, I don't actually know what dosage mm -hmm. she should be taking. And I was asking Kelly, I was like, when, like, what do you recommend to clients who are recovering, who are injured and recovering? Cause it is recommended that you take vitamin D at that point, or at least that's my understanding, I believe. Um, but, and she pointed out, well, you know, obviously it's individualized, but 
um, and depends on their vitamin D status. But something that's even more important is making sure that you're getting enough calories in because if you're not, if you're under fueling, and especially if you're chronically under fueling, that's that's going to be way more important and taking enough vitamin D is not going to do it, like do anything basically. Um, so that was something that was like a little bit of a add on. I was like, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> but I mean, that is a, that is a, a point that I know. And I just forgot, forgot about or forgot to point out. Um, and that was like a nice little addition to our discussion, I feel like, but, um, but yeah, I mean, are you like, what is determining typically when, like when you are recommending vitamin D amounts to people, um, so I know one of the things we talked about was like the rec- like the low end considered like low normal of whatever was it 30 or 32 or is that like lower end is is it actually should be higher than that. Um, but yeah, based on vitamin D status, like what would you say for clients? What are you well, typically telling them to supplement? Yeah. So, you know, going back to your question about the, the 5,000. So I would I would wonder what her her levels were, but that's in line with what we did with our, our insufficient group. Um, so, you know, less than 32. Um, but that's with that particular group, we gave them 35,000 I use per week. <laughs> so yeah. that's 5,000 per day for four weeks. And then we followed that with a, a maintenance dosage of 15,000 I use per week, which comes out to what's that 1500 I use per day. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would say that's probably fine, just depending on how, what her status was to begin with. um, And then how long she's going to stay on it with, with the deficient group, we gave them 50,000 I use um, per week for eight weeks. That's quite a high dosage. And then we followed with that maintenance dosage. Um, you know, so I think the main thing is where, where were their levels to begin with? And then following up, um, within three months is not a bad idea. Um, if I have an athlete who has a, you know, a stress fracture or low energy availability, the, the recommendations there, um, and we may see this change because this is based on the, the 2016 position paper, but, uh, mm-hmm. cal- 1500 milligrams and then 2000 I use a vitamin D um for bone health that seems low it does seem low and <laughs> right yeah no because I remember seeing that because I actually yeah. I recently did a, a sports nutrition presentation and I was looking back to the two sets first of all I kept looking I was like wait has a new position paper come out because I was like I don't think it has is <laughs> no. this is one in the works do you know Not that I know of um you know, I think this one sort of every what eight years, but oh yeah, yeah, maybe. I guess so. But yeah, but I was looking at that and I was like, that just doesn't sound right. Because <laughs> when I think of two thousand IU's or one thousand IU's, I think of yeah, that kind of maintenance or whatever. Um, but like, but maybe just for my listener's sake, kind of, and this is building on some of what we were talking about with supplements. Like, you don't just want to take them randomly and just yeah. be like, oh, it doesn't matter. So, what does happen if say you're taking vitamin D, maybe it is 2000 I use, but let's say it's 5000 I use. Um, and your vitamin D status is relatively normal, or maybe it's like low normal. But what happens if but they do have normal vitamin D, and you're taking it just for extra, you know, good, just in case, what happens? If, um, so if you're taking like a 2000 IU per day dosage, it's yeah, probably fine. Um, you know, unless someone has a really high vitamin D value and they don't, <laughs> um, then we would worry about toxicity symptoms. But, you know, we did a study too. This was years ago. Um, one of my grad students, um, Dana Ogan, she um, gave our athletes a thousand IUs. And so this was really when vitamin D was kind of getting hot. Um, mm-hmm. And we gave it to them during the winter months. So we had a placebo group and then we had our thousand IUs and we really did not find, we, you know, that a thousand did very much <laughs> in the winter yeah, in terms yeah. of their levels. So, you know, it's probably fine if someone is, is taking that 2000 IUs, which is the upper limit. Um, but then yeah. again, 5,000, again, I would just go back to saying, um, get your levels tested before you take a supplement that's not within 
um, you know, the RDA or the recommendations. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's also important, again, to to note, and I mean, it was pretty clear when you talked about this, that you went from the higher dose to the maintenance dose. But again, just saying that these higher dosages are temporary. We're not meant to be on these like super high doses forever, you know? So, um, and, and we are reassessing always. So when it comes to supplementation, and again, you can go listen to that whole episode if you want to learn more about supplements, but but the, the whole idea is that when we are using supplements, that it's for a very specific reason, a very specific purpose, and it may be for a temporary period of time, you know? So um, just kind of, yeah. we don't want to just toss things in our mouth just because we have them around and we're using them up or whatever. Is that, you know, Cause everyone probably has like, I mean, I certainly have like a Costco thing of multivitamins lying around for God knows what reason. I am not like taking those just because I, mean, I think I actually bought them for back when like, you know, COVID started and we didn't know what, what was going to happen to our food supply or something ridiculous in a moment of like, we're going to be stuck eating nothing. I don't know. I was just like buying everything under the sun. Um, but yeah, so we don't, the whole point is that we don't want to just like start popping things in our mouth just because. Um, all right. Anything else that you think deserves a mention in the supplement um, category that we didn't get to? You had mentioned some new research on iron that you want to touch on and anything else you want to touch on? Yeah, I can talk briefly about iron and I think that's it. Um, you know, and I think iron particularly is of concern with your, you know, female endurance. Um, and I'm thinking of one other <laughs> female endurance and who else is at risk for iron deficiency? Vegans. Um, vegans. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> My brain's not working now. Um, but there's some new research that, um, has just come out from McCormick and she is, um, in Australia, but they are, you know, basically looking at iron absorption um, and when is the best time if, if you're really wanting to optimize your absorption from food or supplements, depending on, you know, if someone has a deficiency, but they looked at hepcidin, which is a hormone released from the liver. Um, and it has an inverse relationship with iron absorption. So when hepcidin, hepcidin levels are, are increased, your iron absorption is decreased. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, but it has an interesting relationship with exercise. So hepcidin typically increases about three hours post-exercise and then increases throughout the day. So in the evening, it would be higher than it is in the morning. Um, so basically, I guess practical recommendations from some of the work coming out of their lab is suggesting um, from an iron absorption standpoint, you want to consume your iron rich foods and if you're taking a supplement for iron deficiency anemia um, you would want to do the best time to do that is within 30 minutes after your morning workout oh huh, interesting <laughs> but and then of course you have because like one of the things kelly and i was talking we were talking about was the whole caffeine issue though because typically like you're recommended to like have your coffee like an hour before or an hour after when you're having the iron rich foods or your iron supplement so it's like you're trying to navigate because yeah. I know for me at least post-workout I'm having coffee I'm having food I, know. <laughs> and I happen to take it I have I have like terrible iron and I happen to take a, an iron supplement but right now but um yeah so that's interesting it's, it's like you're constantly working with all these different timing issues um so 30 minutes post exercise in the morning okay but what if people are exercising other times of the day are you then, still doing it in the morning then I still say do it in the morning yeah that's that's kind of seems to be the optimal time of course not with your coffee I'm I'm on the same boat with you iron is really has always been a struggle for me as well and yeah. um so you know of course I find this this very interesting but um yeah, in the or in the morning if you can. And then the other thing they noted too was if you have a sensitive stomach, they looked at alternate days. So taking a supplement um every other day versus daily, and they found no difference actually in ferritin levels at the I think it was the end of a three month period. And so, you know, the mm -hmm. take from there is if you've got a sensitive stomach, maybe look at taking it every other day 
Um, and would you keep the dosage the same in that in that sense in in that situation? They did. It was the exact same dosage. So the the daily group, um, you know, was actually getting more. But you know what they attributed to that was the hepcidin. There were changes in hepcidin along the way as well. Um, so when the body was getting more iron, the hepcidin levels were going up. Um, so kind of interesting. Yeah. Huh. That's just awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. That's really fascinating. Um, yeah. So anything kind of you're working on, anything interesting on the horizon for you? I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm guessing COVID has kind of thrown a wrench in many things for you, but like with all of us. Um, but if there are any kind of new or old projects or anything else that you'd like to share with my listeners, um, I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, so we have um, one paper currently that's under review. It's looking at red S, relative energy mm-hmm. deficiency um, in uh, para-athletes. And this might be the death of me, this paper, but it's... <laughs> review. (laughs) Um, It's just been one of those papers, you know, where I feel like there's been a lot of work um, involved. And um, the other thing is I've got a graduate um, sports nutrition textbook that if everything goes well, will hopefully be published in 2021. That's exciting. Is that your first book? It is. It is. Congrats. I don't know that I'll ever do it again. (laughs) (laughs) I'm yeah I god I'm like the slowest writer of all time I think that's partly like every, like like my mom I'll, I don't know all these people because like you know, like they're like create something create like write a cookbook and I'm like ah, I just like throw things together like write a book and I'm just like I don't know I'm like I'd rather just talk like this is yeah. why I'm podcasting I enjoy talking it doesn't I mean obviously it's still a lot of work like <laughs> It's just like I just talk. I like I feel like with writing I just obsess and I just sit oh. there and take for it just it takes me like years to write anything. I just oh. am so slow. I, I I'm amazed by people who write books. I'm good for you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like even like I when I did this sports nutrition presentation recently for um it was like a local professional organization. It took me like a thousand years to write this thing. I just, ugh, I'm just too slow. Not efficient writer. Um, but that's interesting. So Red S um, as well. So that's coming out. That said, is co- about to come out, you said, the paper? It is under review. So I've just gone oh. through the revisions. <laughs> got it, got so it. Okay. It's in the, the reviewer's hands. <laughs> Anything interesting that you're able to share or is it kind of secret until it comes out? You know, so it was with the para-athlete population. The one thing um, that we found is we use the Leaf Q, which is the, um, it's a validated questionnaire that looks at um, low energy availability female athlete questionnaire, I think is the name of it. Um, but we found a really high risk um, with the Leaf Q, but then actual calculated um, energy availability where you're looking at energy intake and exercise energy expenditure, we found low risk. So there's a disconnect between the questionnaire and calculated and then DEXA. Um, and so I think with, with this population, um, it's kind of hard to separate if they're low bone mineral density, um, hormonal. So we did look at hormones as well. Some of those things are are due to their injury or impairment um, versus actual low energy availability. So, you know, the take home there is we really need population specific um, uh, tools (laughs) and guidelines Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to assessing red S in that group. And just real quick for my listeners who are not familiar with red S, um, I mean, you said what it stands for, but can you just briefly define what it is? Yeah, so so red S relative um, energy deficiency in sport um, is basically refers to the consequences of low energy availability. So this can be um, lack of calories, you know, that that could be due to um, under fueling or increased exercise. Um, energy expenditure. So that could be intentional or unintentional. The athlete might not even know. But the symptoms are physiological symptoms, um, such as we look at bone health, 
endocrine function. We mentioned iron already, but hematological GI. Um, what else am I missing? Menstrual health. And then there's all performance ramifications. Exactly. Um, yeah. 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 And, and this is Red S, I think, deserves a whole episode on its own. So totally. listeners, I will be doing one <laughs> don't worry, in the future at some point, because it's something that a lot of people struggle with. And um, and even if like you're not like full on diagnosed with Red S, a lot of people are kind of chronic, chronically under fueling to some degree and suffering from that. Um, so it's a very important topic um, amongst active people. You don't have to be a professional athlete to to kind of suffer from it. Um, and yeah, so that's that's a big a big one. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, we always finish up my podcast with with my quick bites questions. So we'll dive right into that. What is your favorite meal or snack when you're in a hurry? So snack would be a smoothie and then for a meal, any sort of like variation of a Buddha bowl, like a rice and beans. So there's some type of rice and some type of protein and some type of veggie. Do you eat meat or are you, do you have any like particular diet you follow? No, I don't. I do eat meat. <laughs> okay. Got it. Yeah. I was like, I realized I never asked you that. <laughs> When you said rice and beans, I'm like, oh, I wonder if she's vegetarian. Um, and what is your favorite meal or snack when you're not in a hurry? Um, so meal would be a homemade pizza. And then a snack would be a, a Greek yogurt, nuts, and berries. Yum. Yeah. What is your favorite? Are you, are you still uh, doing, like, sports and stuff these days? I forgot to ask. Yeah, I'm still running. Um, I was supposed to run Chicago this year, but that got. Oh. I know. Uh-huh. Have you run? Have you run Chicago before? I haven't. No, I'm oh, excited. So fun. Please that's where back. I got my PR. That's like, oh, yeah, wow. it was a fun course, and that's where I qualified for Boston. So it holds a special place in my heart. <laughs> so, still is my PR. Like after, basically after that, I just like ditched road marathoning. <laughs> it was like I'm done. Okay. <laughs> but it's a, it's a really it's a fun course, fun race. Um, well, hopefully, hopefully next year for you. Um, yeah. what, so what is your favorite post race meal or snack? Definitely a burger and a beer. <laughs> I feel you there. Yeah. What is your biggest cooking catastrophe? Oh gosh, uh, this happens all the time. <laughs> to be honest with you, I feel like I burn something weekly. But um, you know, I think the thing that stands out the most is I made a chocolate cake for um, one of my kiddos' birthday, and I hid it in the oven, thinking it would be fine. And my husband turned the oven on. Oh gosh! <laughs> <laughs> Every week. Oh. So, oh man! See my Did it just melt like, or burn? Like what happened to it? But the smoke alarm started going off and everything. Oh. And your poor kiddo didn't have a cake. Oh no! That I'm like, oh, uh, <laughs> oh well. So live and learn. Um, what is the most bizarre or exotic food that you've ever tried? Um, I had escargot when I was in France. Did you like it? You know what? I don't remember much about it being good or bad. <laughs> I don't think it was <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I feel like I, I, I tried it like ages ago and just, I just remember butter or something. <laughs> it's just buttery yeah. or slimy or I don't remember what it was. Um, how do you like your eggs cooked? I like them soft boiled. Yum. And what is your favorite beverage? Um... I have can I choose two there? <laughs> yes. It could be alcoholic, non alcoholic, whatever. Good. Coffee and red wine for sure. Mm, I agree with you there. <laughs> what are your comfort foods? Uh ice cream. And oh perfect. What's your favorite ice cream flavor? That was my next question. Um, coffee. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I love my and coffee. last yeah, and last but not least, top three items of gear that are most essential to your active lifestyle. So I have a, a Movo board. I don't know if you've heard of What's that. that. It's uh, oh. gosh, it's this stability board. It really works on um, foot strength. Um, the they're out of Bend, Oregon, but I, I highly recommend it. I feel like it's it's done a lot for my knees and my feet. Um, cool. And keep healthy. <laughs> yeah. Um. A mountain, my mountain bike, which I recently purchased this summer, and then 
my running shoes, which are I'm loving right now. I have Nike Infinity React. Mm -hmm. I think nice. Fantastic. <laughs> awesome. Are you do you have like many like trails and stuff where you are or like because you're you're outside of Seattle. I mean, you're obviously in central Washington. I mean, obviously <laughs> from central Washington University, I imagine I had to like look up where you were and where that even is. But um, but I saw like your picture in the snow. I imagine you got some like good mm -hmm. places to run and everything. We are like um, a quarter mile from a big trail system. So, yeah, we're wow. definitely love spoiled. Um, trail running is so fun. I love it. Yes, me too. <laughs> uh, can't really do too much right now, but when I'm out in California, I, I have a field day out there. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kelly, for coming on the show and sharing so much knowledge with us and all your research. Um, I'm excited to, to read some of your papers. I, I kind of skimmed the one you sent me and I, I haven't really read too much more, but definitely going to be reading more that, of the stuff that you published. So, um, so yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Of course. And uh, I'll definitely have to get you on again to kind of refresh our knowledge of what's out there in the research world. I definitely, I mean, I try my best to keep up with it all. And um, I mean, it's just, there's so much. And I mean, I guess that's where in our profession, you know, the continuing ed credits come in and all the things you can do for that, which I have to kind of get my butt in gear there. <laughs> but it can be really hard to keep up with everything. So it, it's nice to have someone on like you who can share like, you know, some of the smaller things, I mean, they're not, obviously they're not inconsequential, like they're important stuff, but some of these smaller studies that maybe I wouldn't otherwise catch. So yeah. Oh, totally. Awesome. Yeah. All right. We'll have a wonderful holiday season and okay. thank you again. Thank you. So that wraps up today's show with Kelly Pritchett. I hope you enjoyed our discussion. I know things did get a little technical at times, but hopefully we were able to break it down for you guys and give you guys some good takeaways to apply to your own training and daily life. Right now, it's a few days before Christmas, and I think this episode will be coming out in the new year. So I just want to take this opportunity again to thank you all for your support, for listening to all of the shows I've put out so far, or maybe just some of them. But I really appreciate you. If you haven't left a rating or review on iTunes, I always, always appreciate that. So please do that. I think I have 48 right now and really just looking to get the, getting that up since right now this is um, an unsponsored, unpaid show so that I'm just putting out with my own free time, whatever that means. Um, but would like to get this you know show growing a bit more and uh, your help is always appreciated. So wishing you guys all a very happy holidays. We made it through 2020. Thank God. So good job to all of you guys. We made it. 2021 surely will not be easy. I know it's not like COVID is going anywhere anytime soon, but it's looking a little brighter and I'm um, just wishing you all a very happy new year. So I will speak to you all in 2021 and until then have a wonderful break. <laughs>